We'd like to welcome you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's great to have you with us, and we have a lot of uh, great things happening this morning. Check out in your bulletin. Be sure to uh, put some coins in the two-cent a meal offering today. I think there's a bucket out there by the offering plate, and uh, that is one of the main ways that our denomination supports food insecurity around the world. So that is for today. And I have an announcement from Doug, I think, first. A couple of announcements. Um, and just a side note, Deb Bendit and I went out to Glenn Krebs service in Clearfield yesterday. And as, well, as we were driving, I said, Deb, who's the worship leader tomorrow? And she's like, let me look. We do communicate. <laughs> so there's a correction in the bulletin with the alpaca fundraiser. Um, the profit after, after all the expenses was $11,375 between the two weekends. So we want to thank you for your support. And uh, we look forward to seeing how God will use, use those funds uh, to support the ministry here and beyond. There are cards in the uh, office. This, this Friday is our Blue Christmas service at 7 p.m. If you're unaware of what a Blue Christmas service is, it's, uh, this is a joyful time of year, but not for everyone. People experience loss, uh, broken expectations, broken relationships. There's a lot of questions that go unanswered in that grief, confusion, anger. This service allows us to acknowledge the less than joyful emotions that we may experience this time of year. It's typically a very intimate service and a very impactful service. The first year we held this, it was foggy to the point where people were missing Metzler. There were about 15 people here, and in my mind I was thinking, well, we tried it, great. Uh, we won't be doing that next year. And almost everyone that came, including the people who participated, came up to me with either ideas for the following year or to share how, how meaningful it was. So, and what we want you to do, if you decide to come, if you've lost a loved one, if there's a broken relationship, if there's a broken expectation, we invite you to bring something to leave here. We will have a table up front to leave here to release into God's hands the... Uh, the Advent wreath will be down here. And then this is what this announcement is all about. There are cards in the office along the table. There are condolence cards, encouragement cards. We'd invite you to sign one, put a scripture in there, put words of encouragement, words of presence, so that as people leave, they can take something. And when they get home, they can read your words of encouragement. They can read your, your words of prayer. Again, it's in the office, um, and there are pens there. There are about 10 cards there that you can sign. So just rotate around or you know, pass them if there are more than, more than two or three people there. So thank you. Okay. Um. Tom Connolly would like uh, us to remember that there are giving envelopes on the table. Please let him know if um, you would like to sign up for that. Um, and let's see here. I think we're up to Mary Lou. Good morning. Just a note. Uh, for anybody that's interested, we still have chili for sale, and it will be in the, I guess it'll, <laughs> it'll be out here in the gym after church. I had a lot of good reviews from people saying it was just the right amount of heat. Other people said they added a lot of chili powder to it, so <laughs> whichever suits your fancy. At this time, I would like... Doug, Jeff, Emmy, and Laura to come up here in front and stand on the lower floor, please. This thing's in the way. 
You can face the congregation. You don't have to look at me. <laughs> I'm not a girl. Okay. Christmas time is the time to give gifts. And we often think of people that do things for us, uh, like a teacher or the bus driver, uh, people that help us out on our daily lives. As a member of the leadership team, I'm giving each of you a gift on behalf of the congregation of these four people. The congregation appreciates the gifts you share with us throughout the year. Here at Hempfield Church of the Brethren, we are blessed with pastors and leaders of our children's ministry team who sincerely love God and seek to do his will. Our leadership team has seen them in many capacities as our pastors and children leaders, as our colleagues, as our brothers and sisters in Christ. In all these roles, they remain steadfast to the call of God, not only in their position of leadership within the church, but in their personal walk with God. They are consistently sought to grow spiritually, not just as a church leader, but as a member of the congregation. They encourage one another, hold one another accountable, and lead the congregation to do the same. They share the gift of leading and teaching us God's love and challenge us to walk and talk the life of a believer. These leaders have encouraged us to reach out to others in needs and send our love to our surrounding community. God love shines in good people with kind hearts doing nice things. To each of you, thank you for sharing your gifts and shining your light on our congregation. At this time, members of the leadership team or on a team will give the gifts to our leaders. Well, today is all about joy. How have you experienced joy in your life? How long did it last? Have you considered joy to be part of God's gift to you? And how would you express it? Those were some of Pastor Jeff's prompts for us to think about this morning. I um, was part of a study here called Fight Back with Joy, Margaret Feinberg, and I'd recommend it. At first, when I heard the title, I was like, eh, Okay, I, I wasn't sure how I felt about it, if it was like the toxic positivity type thing. But um, it was a really wonderful study. And I was thinking about um, our teachers for how to be joyful. And I have a great teacher for, for how to be joyful. I'm not pointing at Douglas, I'm pointing at Katie. <laughs> Just uh, some of the ways that they said about spreading joy um, in your everyday life, we all do these, but I just thought it'd be a nice way to start this morning, to smile. Go ahead, give it a try. Smile to somebody. <laughs> to radiate grace. It's when something happens that's not the way you intended, to um, respond with gentleness and compassion, to help them clean up the mess. To sing or hum throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Yep, check. To place an exclamation point on today, um, just giving something uh, extra to the day and giving it for God, whatever it would be. This kind of made me laugh, this one, because I'm one of those people who writes an email and like deletes all my exclamations so I don't appear crazy, you know, I'm like I need a period in there. Write a note of blessing to someone you love. And I think that can be um, so easy for some people. Katie, you write notes of love all the time to your teachers, to us, and, um, but I'm such a bad note writer, especially card. So some of these she talked about as a discipline, and that really spoke to me because I'm not 
wired to be a card writer and those sort of intentional things, but it can be a discipline living in this way. To do something you love, enjoying what God has given us, not in a way that's all about us, but just being present and thankful. Striking up a conversation with a stranger. Um, <clears throat> so those were some of the things in that first section that I thought I'd highlight to you. And then I have a quote for you by uh, Kay Warren. And she says, joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all of the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise God in all things. To praise God in all things. And again, that was one of those that I was like, rejoice when you face trials, that verse came to mind. Rejoice when it makes no sense, she said. And uh, Philippians is considered to be an epistle of joy with joy or rejoice used over 16 times. And there's so much to share with this that I'm going to forget it, but one of the things that she said, and I'm going to paraphrase, was that we're rejoicing. We're just echoing it back to God. And it makes me think of repeat the sounding joy. So let's repeat the sounding joy this morning as we come together in worship. And we're going to have our best teachers up um, with Mrs. Bendit. Deb's going to come up with the, teach with the children this morning for a children's lesson. I did not pray, though, so let me first pray. <laughs> all right. God, we thank you so much for all the people in our lives that bring us joy. We thank you that you are the joy giver and that you've wired us to uh, share and spread joy, the joy that comes from you. God, we pray for everybody who might be feeling uh, sadness or heaviness and we just pray, Lord, that you help us to remember that uh, in the midst of those things, you still are our joy. You still are our, our center and our hope. We thank you for this time of year when we can remember that you are God with us. And we pray that you help us to hold the joy of you in our hearts uh, today, in these moments, and as we go forward through the week and this season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, would Mrs. Bendit and the children please come forward? Okay, children, you can come forward. What I would like for you to do right now is to stand up here and face the screen because we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, word that's on the screen. So come on up. I want to talk to the smallest people here for a few minutes. I'm thinking that they don't know how to read yet, but I want you to look at that word up there. How many letters are in that word? Can you count them? There are three exactly right. I heard some good counting there. And do you know the letters? Do you know what the letters are? Go ahead. J-O-Y, yeah, there's one, two, three letters, it's J-O-Y, and the word is joy. joy. That's exactly right. We're going to talk a little bit about joy today, and um, what I was uh, wondering is, first of all, do you see some other words, joy, around our sanctuary? Look around a little bit and see, oh, there's one on that pretty banner. Do you see another one anywhere? Yes, over there hanging up and over there too. Joy, J-O-Y, one, two, three. Yes. Yes, I wanted to show you. Dave and I were at a uh, concert just about uh, a little over a week ago, and I saw on the merchandise table this T-shirt. And I said, oh, Dave, I think I would like to have that. And so we got it because it says joy also. Okay, I have a lot of joy in my life, and let me tell you why. A long time ago, I had a little baby girl, and we named her Maria Joy. Do you see the word joy up there? We had a, a little boy also, but when he grew up, he married a beautiful lady, and her name was 
Stella Joy, another Joy. Well, Dan and Stella had a little baby girl, and they named her Eliza Joy. And Maria and her husband had a little girl on my birthday, actually, which was really special, and they named her Neve Joy. Maria and Ryan and her family live in the city that's not too far, the little town, called Mount Joy. And um, let's see, Dave and I are part of a disc golf league. Can you believe it? And uh, the name of our team is Indescribable Joy. So I have a lot of joy in my life. I love it. Well, the Bible is filled with words like joy and rejoice. Um, Ms. Jen talked about what rejoice means, to kind of bring up that feeling of joy in your life. Um, and in fact, the Bible has a lot of verses about joy. And I wanted to show you one that uh, is special to me. This is from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. There's that word joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Wouldn't it be awesome if everybody had those characteristics? Well, when you follow Jesus, he gives us the spirit, and we have um, the ability to have these, these awesome things more and more in our lives. Okay, what I would like for you to do now is sit down, but because of these cords, how about if everybody sits over here where there are no more cords? Thank you. Okay, I want to share a story about um, something that happened to me just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we were with some of those grandchildren um, at Chuck E. Cheese. Has anyone ever been there before? Okay, so we had fun playing with our grandchildren, but after a while, Dave and I got a little tired, and so we sat down on some of the bench seats that were there. And we were just kind of watching the children as they were playing um, in the background. And I noticed there was a little girl, and she came running, and she was crying. And she was only maybe about four or five years old, but she was crying. So as she came toward me and she was crying, I, I got down and I said, what's wrong, honey? And she said, I lost my... Can you guess what she lost? She lost her mom. She couldn't find her mom. And so I think that God gave me an idea. And I said, you know, why don't you get up here on the bench seat? Because she was little, we couldn't, she couldn't see over the back of the benches. And I said, come in and stand up here. And I said, you look and you see if you see your mommy. And she looked. And then she pointed, and I saw her mommy. But her mommy was looking for her. She was looking like this, but she had her head to the back of us, so she didn't see us. So I grabbed the little girl, and I said, you keep your eye on her, and we're going to go get her. So I carried her away, and unfortunately, she was pretty heavy for me, so I had to set her down. But by that time, we were beyond the bench seats, and we could see her, and we both kind of ran over to her. And her mommy, when she turned around and saw her little girl, she just got down and scooped her up into her arms, and they were both so, so happy. Well, Jesus tells a lot of stories in the Bible, things about um, things that were lost, people that were lost, and they were found. And that caused a lot of joy in the person. And that's what all three of us experienced when we saw the two that were lost and they were found. It gave them joy. Um, okay, um, let me see. Every week we've been having a wrapped gift for you to look at. Now, unlike those in the back there, this one might be a little bit harder to guess. Would anybody like to guess what's in this one? Go ahead, Caitlin. 
What do you think might be in it? Do you want to feel it? Let's see. Do you think there's another bowling ball in there? It's a box, yeah. What's, what's, what, do you want to guess what's in here? Okay, go ahead. What do you think? It sounds like a smaller box. She kind of went up and down like that. Well, this one, we are going to have to wait and see about this package. All of these packages are going to be unwrapped on Christmas Eve. That's only in 13 days. When you come to the church service on Christmas Eve, somebody's going to unwrap this, and you'll find out what is in this box because there's definitely something that's sliding around in there. So come uh, on Christmas Eve. Okay, by the way, do you happen to notice what's written on this paper? There's all kinds of words, joy, 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 joy. Yes, I picked that out especially for today. (laughs) And polka dots, that's right. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, thank you so, so much for our being here today. Thank you, Lord, for giving us joy. And we just pray for these children, that they would come to know you, that they would soak up the lessons about Jesus um, and read the Bible on their own and learn how to have more and more fruit of the Spirit, especially joy. And we just thank you for their moms and dads and their teachers who help them. And uh, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I have a gift for you. Before you leave. Okay. Something nutritious. We have some grapes. Would somebody want to count how many? Well, first of all, tell the congregation, what color are the grapes? Green and red. What's sort of special about green and red at this time of year? It's for Christmas. It's for Christmas. And how many? These, they're all the same. How many of each are in here? Caitlin? Three green and three red. I wonder why I chose three green and three red. Does anybody have an idea? Go ahead. It does make six. That's good adding. Anyone else? Three? For the three letters in joy. One, two, three, J-O-Y. So here you go. You can have some grapes, and um, you can go back to your parents, and we're going to sing some songs. Listen for the word joy or rejoice in these songs, too. I think you're going to hear it. Okay, you want to take one? As the children are returning to their seats, would you please stand and join us for the call to worship? The Lord is our light and our salvation. Why should we be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold of our life. What have we to fear? Let us shout with joy to God. Let us sing and make music before our God. We walk in darkness. We live in a land of deep darkness. We have seen a great light. Light shines upon us. God brings us joy. Rejoice before our God. Come and worship God. Join us as we praise. Um, We just welcome in Emmanuel, God with us. One, two, three.
This week, as I've been in your word and as I've been studying, I've just been reminded of the ultimate gift this baby will bring. He died on a cross for our sins, and even now, he's preparing that place for us for eternity. Lord God, may we just receive that with exceeding joy, the greatness that you are and the provision you have made. We are blessed to be called your people. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This song, Beautiful Star of Bethlehem, that we're going to share with you was requested by uh, Jerry Hurst um, one Christmas when we were doing carol sing online. And it was new to me. But Rod knows it, so Rod is our beautiful star of Bethlehem this morning. <laughs>
Thank you, Jerry, for sharing it with us. We would have had Cheryl too, but she's being grandma, taking, taking care of a little one who's not feeling well. All right, at this time, uh, let's let God's word minister to us. This is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 8, verses 5 through 17. I think I have the right translation. Sorry if any of my words are different. The Lord spoke to me again. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoices over Rezin and the son of Ramalia, therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the Euphrates, the king of Assyria with all his pomp. It will overflow all its channels, run over all its banks, and sweep on into Judah, swirling over it, passing through it, and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land, Emmanuel. Raise the war cry, you nations, and be shattered. Listen, all you distant lands. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. This is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Uh, I'm doing a study with a few ladies on Friday morning uh, for Revelation, and it was interesting. Uh, this is a right now media study. The man who is leading it talked about prophets, and it's, it's neat. I'll make a plug for children's ministry upstairs. If you've ever taught uh, a class with the kids upstairs, you learn so much. Um, when you teach, you learn. And uh, so we were talking about what a prophet is, and the prophet Isaiah specifically. And the exercise that we did, we had two prophets, prophet one and prophet two, and whatever prophet one said came true in the class experiment that we did, and whatever prophet two said didn't come true. And so that was how we were understanding what a prophet is. But he said something like only 17% in the Bible only 17% of prophecy is about what's future prediction. Am I saying that right? Eh, I'm getting that. <laughs> You'll have to listen to the study yourself. But it was interesting because that was sort of my definition of what prophecy is, what a prophet is. But uh, he said it was giving the people a call, a warning, a heed to turn, to turn back to the Lord. And so that's what I thought of as I'm reading these words this morning from Isaiah. Please join me in prayer as we come to God and ask for his understanding. God, we just, we thank you so much that we have the joy and hope that we have in you. And God, that it's not just for us, it's for everybody. It's for those who aren't here this morning. It's for those who wouldn't say that they know you. God, help us to have your eyes and to know when we need to turn to you because we all do in every situation in our lives, every moment of our day. And sometimes that looks like worrying about what's going to happen instead of trusting in you. And sometimes it looks like us thinking that our way is better. God, we just pray that you would give us humility and obedience and uh, your word. Help us, Lord, to have your Holy Spirit in us. God, we thank you for this time of year and for all the uh, tangible ways that we see joy around us. 
We thank you for your creation and for the beauty and uh, joy bombs that you give us in every day. Help us to open our eyes to see them. Help us, Lord, to meet the needs of those around us. Help us to approach our life as a discipline, as a joy to bring joy to others, to be intentional about that. And God, help us to know that it's not on us or from us, but it's from you. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather together. We thank you for time with the children, for time with music, for time with your word. And we just pray that everything that we do would be pleasing to you, God. At this time, we come to you together and bring back to you the words that your son Jesus led us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's rejoice. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 210, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. You may be seated. We continue on in the next chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> okay. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoiced when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, 
and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And before Pastor Jeff gives his message, he asks for a special uh, song from you. That you have to sing along with. Mm -hmm. You have to sing along with it. And I thought that um, maybe you could help out too. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So, the children are gone, so <laughs> put on your best, uh, joyful, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, and maybe you can do the where. Where? Where, okay. Where? What do you think? He should be in charge of the where. <laughs> we'll see how he does with that. We might have to make him repeat it. All right, we're just doing the first verse, okay? You ready? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? The joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. You know, on the joy meter, I'd give that about a three. <laughs> Not a five. No. We'll Thanks, Jen. Thanks. Yes. We'll see if we can do better by the end of the message today. Joy. What the world is there to be joyful about today? Well, as it turns out, there's a lot to be joyful about if we just take a look at it. Let's go back in time. Let's take a look at Israel. Imagine living in Israel, the divided kingdom. The southern kingdom was Judah, and Judah's capital was Jerusalem. The northern kingdom was Israel, and its capital was Samaria. Do you start to see some of the reasons why people weren't too happy with the Samarians? So this, this was a split kingdom after the people revolted against the heavy taxes that both Solomon and Rehoboam levied about 975 B.C. There was a split. So there was a split because some people didn't think they should be paying the taxes they were paying, while others saw it as something that was necessary. Does it sound familiar at all? Threats from a powerful invader. The Assyrians were about to uh, come and conquer uh, Israel. <clears throat> Kings shifted from serving God to serving their own interests. There's a great uh, passage that's repeated throughout the book of Kings. In those days, there were no kings, but the people wanted them. And the kings who they got uh, became more interested in their own interests and their own self-aggrandizement uh, than they did uh, in, in serving the people. Again, nothing similar to today. Despair, unhappiness, depression, fear, and anxiety must have been common. Must have been common. Must have been very difficult to live during those days. And God calls Isaiah. The Assyrian Empire threatened Israel about 740 B.C. God calls Isaiah to become a prophet. A prophet, according to one source, is a person who speaks for God, calling his covenant people to return to their mission, as Jen said earlier. But he speaks for God. What he says is God's message to the people. Isaiah proclaims this to be a warning from God to a godless people. Ooh. So this is some serious stuff. Imagine hearing Isaiah's prophecy. Imagine that. Terrifying warnings of judgment and destruction, as in Isaiah 8 that Jen read. Imagine what that must have been like to, to hear that. This is what's going to happen to you. But then imagine, too, that um, there were uplifting messages of hope and prosperity in, in, in Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 has some uplifting, positive things that are going to happen. 
predicting the coming of the Messiah who would redeem his people from their sins. And that's what Christmas is about, right? Us remembering this. Isaiah 9 starts, There will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. Gloom. An atmosphere of depression and mel melancholy. You'll have my permission to look out the window right now. <laughs> gloom. Gloom. Imagine that that's what it's like every day. That's the mood that people are in. Gloom. Distress, an oppressive state of physical, mental, social, or economic adversity. People are caught up in what's important to them, not what's important to God. But he's saying there's not going to be less of this. There's going to be no more gloom and no more despair. No more. None. Whew, sign me up for that. Imagine hearing that. How would, you, how would you have reacted if you had heard Isaiah's words? Would you have said... What's this guy smoking? Is this guy for real? Or would you have had hope? Would you have changed your outlook on life? In the past, he humbled the land, Isaiah says. Ben-Hadad of Syria conquered Naphtali. We find that in 1 Kings. 200 years later, King Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria had the, had the people of Zebulun and Naphtali deported to Assyria, including the people from Gilead and Galilee. This is really important. The people from Gilead and Galilee were deported to Assyria. And then they were resettled with a mixed race of Jews and Gentiles and colonized with heathens. The southern Jews despised those from Galilee. And that didn't change even during Jesus' time, 700 years later. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. Well, Jen was talking about prophets and things coming true 17% of the time. Let's check and see. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to, be, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. The future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. Imagine the celebration uh, when this happened. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. <laughs> increased their joy. Enlarged the nation. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. As men rejoice when dividing the plunder. That's kind of a... Uh, Serious image, I think. But, but this is the rejoicing that's going on. Rejoice means to express great joy. Biblical joy is one, one de definition, is a feeling of good pleasure and happiness that is dependent on who Jesus is rather than who we are or what's happening around us. That's where true, real joy comes from in the Bible, recognizing who Jesus is, what he means to us, what he means to our lives. Joy, rejoice, or joyful appears 430 times in the ESV. 430 times. And in the Old Testament, it appeared over 100 times with 15 different Hebrew words to describe what joy was. Francis Chan says, The Bible teaches that true joy is formed in the, in the midst of the difficult seasons of life. True joy doesn't happen to people who are living the, living the life of Riley. There's an old one, right? <laughs> the life of Riley. Who are living a good life. It doesn't come to them. It comes to people. True joy comes to people in difficult seasons of life. Let's take a look at some. You might remember David. David was uh, experiencing some, some really bad things in his life. And uh, he was threatened by a lot of things. And one night, uh, he woke up the next day, and he experienced joy. And he says in Psalm 30, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing, and clothed me with gladness, joy. You might remember the parable of the, the uh, prodigal son. The father says, We had to celebrate and rejoice 
because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So in the midst of the difficulties of life, joy appears. You might remember in Acts, Paul and Barnabas are attacked by a bunch of people, uh, and uh, they say, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Even though they were attacked and run out of town, they, they shook the dust off their sandals and they moved on. So joy was experienced in the midst of difficulties. Imagine experiencing true joy. True joy. The angel tells Zechariah in Luke, your son John will be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. Imagine what that would have been like to be the father, to be Zechariah. The, the boy that you're going to have, the boy that you thought you would never have is not only going to be born, he's going to be a reason for rejoicing and joy. When Mary visits Elizabeth, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Uh, I don't know what that would have been like for Elizabeth, but, uh, but uh, that, that's, a, that's a strong, powerful expression of joy. Mary says, my, glo- my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. When John was born to Elizabeth, her neighbors and relatives shared her joy. The angel appears to the shepherds and tells them, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Joy. Joy is everywhere. The people walking in darkness have seen the great light, Isaiah predicts. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Darkness is the weight of hundreds of years of oppression. And lightness is the rekindling of hope. What is that hope? Imagine seeing the light. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared on them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now those of you who are fans of the Messiah by Handel are singing right now. The glory of the Lord, right? Handel wrote the Messiah in 24 days. He he went into his apartment in London on August the 22nd. And 24 days later came out with the completed Messiah. And he used a lot of this Isaiah passage for that. Imagine following the light. Imagine being one of the the wise men. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born uh, King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Imagine following that light. Imagine being the light. Jesus says, when Jesus spoke, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Wow. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Then Isaiah says, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you. So what's happened? God's reunited Israel. Enlarged, combined, or increased by multiplication. Rejoice, express great joy. People are happy because they're one nation again. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. So you might remember Midian was the nation that held Israel uh, captive for seven years until Gideon defeated them. And he says that shattered the yoke that burdens them. Jesus says later, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke is shattered. A different yoke has replaced it. 
And then we have, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. The angel said to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Luke later writes, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, who was experiencing a child. What? expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for a baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. For unto us a child is given. To, for, to us a son is given. And he will be called Wonderful, meaning extraordinary, mysterious, or difficult to comprehend. He will be called Counselor, someone who gives advice about problems. Mighty God, having great power and authority. Everlasting Father, lasting forever. Prince of Peace, harmonious relations and freedom from disputes, the absence of war. I think that's one of the most powerful passages in Scripture. When we name somebody, God named Adam and gave him authority to name all the creatures. Now God is naming Jesus and giving him these names as well. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Justice, being free from favoritism, self-interest, bias, or deception. Justice. Righteousness, adherence to what is required according to a standard. Luke writes, The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Again, prophecy fulfilled. Jesus is the Son of God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord. <laughs> Excessive fervor to do something or accomplish some end. God is zealous. God is anxious to get this done. He is working nonstop. Nothing is getting in his way. This is his main focus. This is what matters most to God. Put something into effect entirely or thoroughly. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So again, prophecy is fulfilled. So imagine, imagine, you wake up and life has no depression, anxiety, resentment, or anger. There's none. Imagine that. Imagine no bad news. None. None. Imagine no physical, mental, social, or economic hardships. Imagine leaders were free from favoritism, self-interest, bias, or deception. Imagine you lived life filled nonstop with irrepressible joy. Imagine what that would be like. What would Isaiah say about today? Would he say, gloom and distress? Would he say, people are walking in darkness? Would he say, we're living in the land of the shadow of death? Is there no hope? When's the last time you truly experienced joy? Now, not because of who you are or what's happening to you, but because of your understanding, your relationship with Jesus Christ. When's the last time you experienced that joy that comes? Are you able to focus on who Jesus is in your life and what he means to you? Are we able to do that collectively? Can we somehow show our collective joy in all that Jesus has done for us and is doing for us? Biblical joy is an emotion of great pleasure and happiness by knowing and being focused on Jesus, 
living by faith in God's word, remaining in Jesus and in his Holy Spirit, enduring and content in all things. Last month I preached on contentment. Joy is a function of contentment. We have God's gift of joy. Believers receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy, as Deb said. I should have just let Deb preach this one. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. But love, joy, and peace. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It comes, it comes as a package. It's, some, it's a function of being in Jesus Christ and accepting him. A spirit-controlled person is always in full control of mind, body, and words. I read that, and I was like, yeah, sure. But uh, it's true. It's true. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit, abiding in God's presence and from hope in his word. Abiding in God's presence and hope in his word. We have an advantage that these people didn't have. The advantage we have is we've seen a great light. Jesus is the light who has dawned. We know who Jesus is. We know what he's done. We know who he's conquered. We know what he means in our lives. We are an active part of his body. Are you fully experiencing this joy of Christ? Are you experiencing your gratitude through unbridled rejoicing? God wants you to experience the joy of his spirit. He wants you to feel that joy. He wants you to know his son. He wants you to rejoice, to celebrate uncontrollably because of your relationship with him and your realization of how much he loves you. Now, that's really difficult for brethren and brethren in Lancaster County to celebrate joyfully, uncontrollably. Why? I don't know, because we're controlled. We can't let people know we're too happy. We can't let people know what's going on. But you know what happens? Imagine expressing this true joy. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us, Rejoice. let us, Rejoice. let us, Rejoice. and be glad. Yes. Yeah. So every fall, people gather several times to mostly rejoice in this place. Mostly. Right out, mostly. And every year, every game starts a chant. We are... We are, we are, thank you, uh, thank you, you're welcome, right, good, 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 yeah, but we're going to try something today, we're going to try an experiment, we're going to divide this half of the congregation and this half, so this, this, you're going to be the we are and you're going to be the God's people, okay, so let's try this. Amen and Amen. yes, yes. Let's, let's uh, make sure that we can express our joy going into this season. Let's not let the gloom and darkness get in our way. And let's, let's rejoice that we're God's people. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, which comes from Beethoven's Ode to Joy, which was a, a song that he wrote. It was a symphony that he wrote. Uh, that has to do with the end of warfare. Peace, ode to joy.
What great words. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, praising thee, their sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Let that be our prayer as we leave here. Amen. On behalf of Hempfield Church of the Brethren, we thank you for joining us for today's service. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.